Okay, perfect. Okay, once again, welcome everybody to our Fridays with Fiscal. Um, you know, we're gonna end our work week with talking about EMIS um, and those EMIS errors. So what a way to end it, right? Um, hopefully everybody has had a couple cups of coffee. Um, I did want to welcome um, Teresa Williams, who is on our um, training this morning with us. Um, for those of you that have been around, um, you know, at the ITC, in the ITC world for some time, you'll know um, that Teresa has been, you know, involved um, for a while now. Um, she was with the payroll team um, prior to her current role with, um, the, as a um, SSDT project manager, and she works closely with ODE. Um, so I welcome her, um, you know, she's a wealth of knowledge and I appreciate her um, joining us this morning. So we have a couple more people in the waiting room, sorry. Okay. So again, this morning we're gonna talk about um, EMIS um, and those errors. And I know, um, you know, it, this is the time of year where, um, you know, the, the final staff collection is gonna be coming to a close in a couple months. So we're gonna, you know, you're gonna be getting lots of questions and we're hoping after today's um, session, we can kind of help you, um, you know, know where to go, um, resources to look at um, and so forth. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I thought I would um, begin pointing out and probably a lot of you already know this, but I think sometimes the terminology between um, you know, the two systems being payroll and um, EMIS when it gets to you know, ODE can be confusing. So we're gonna talk through some of those terms um, and the differences in that terminology. And one being just you know, when we're talking about you know, CI, CK, CJ, CC, what does that even mean? Excuse me. So when it comes to the EMIS world, you know, that's the CI record, it means your staff demographic record. The CK record means your staff employment record. CJ means the contractor staff employment record and the CC means contract only staff record. So those equate to certain areas then on the payroll side. So the CI is pulling information from the employee record. The CK is pulling from um, information from the position and also the compensation. Remember, those are two parts now. In Classic, that was just pulled from one area. Um, and then if you have, um, or the district has any of those contractor staff employment records, that's gonna be on the EMIS screen under that um, contractor or CJ tab. And then lastly, the CC um, is under, again, that EMIS entry screen and um, under the, EMIS contracted services or CC tab. So, you know, those connections are being made automatically through the SOAP service um, when a collection is run, except for the CJ and the CC um, information. Those have to be actually, you know, um, extracted and then those files need to be uploaded to the data collector so that information is included in the collection. Okay. So getting started, um, you know, we tried to um, put out a report that would mimic per debt. So our first attempt, and we know it's a very, um, you know, preliminary um, report, um, is the, the two reports in the EMIS reports um, that can be run then and should be run um, as many times, you know, as soon as the district is ready to begin their collection. So this is the first thing that we would like districts to get accustomed to doing. Um, while the report itself is not very user-friendly, um, we are aware of that. You know, we'll see here in a second that, you know, the, the errors aren't specific to what um, the problem may be, but, those are records that are going to cause problems then when it gets to the data collector side. So before it even gets to that point, 
We do encourage districts to run those two EMIS reports, the employee report and the position report until those are air free. So <clears throat> when you go to run those reports and I'm going to pull that screen over here. Sorry, my session logged out here. So under reports, what we're talking about are, are these two EMIS reports. So you're gonna run the, the or the district will wanna run the EMIS or the employee report and the position report. So when these are run, then I've already generated those. You can see down at the bottom that my employee report has four errors. All of the errors basically say the same thing. This employee will not be reported. Please contact your ITC. Not very helpful, right? Um, so we've taken that one step further and put together a checklist that's out on our SSDT trainings and document page that can help you help the district really determine what those errors mean. Okay, so it's under the ITC only supported resources slash material section. It's called debugging EMIS reports. So if you open that checklist, it's going to step you through then the steps to help your district determine, you know, what those errors, what might be causing those errors. Um, we're going to step through that process now. So um, again, it's all outlined here in this checklist, um, but I did want to step you through it just to, you know, familiarize you, you with it and make you more comfortable. So again, the district runs these two reports. Okay, our employee report has errors. I need to know now what those errors pertain to. So what I would, what you'll want to do is go to system. And again, this is you at the ITC level, okay? So you're gonna to have to work with the with your district um, at, for the time being. So we're gonna to go to system and we're gonna to go to monitor. So um, within the monitor um, area, there's a, a tab called logging. What we wanna do, and again, this is all outlined step-by-step step in that checklist, is we're gonna search for the name EMIS error. And this very first line here that ends with EMIS reporting, we want to turn the debugging option on for this um, particular reporting. So you'll have to kind of double click in that um, field and it brings up a, a drop down. And we're going to click debug. So it says debug here. Now we're going to click save. And you can see now that the level for EMIS reporting has switched to debug. Okay, now we're gonna go back and we're gonna run those two reports again. So this is the key. So those two reports um, have to be run, or in this case, since we know that um, the just the EMIS um, employee report had errors, you could just run that report, you know, knowing that that's the one that we need to dive deeper into. Once you run those, um, that report or those two reports, then it's kind of doing some investigating, so to speak, debugging behind the scenes. And it's gonna give us lots of information that's gonna be more helpful um, in knowing you know, where those problem areas are. Mm -hmm. So once those are run, what you'll wanna do is now we're gonna to come to that same area. So system, monitor, but now we're gonna to switch to the admin, or I'm sorry, the app log, my bad. Now what this is gonna show us is something similar to this and hopefully you guys can see it. I wanted to bring up um, the screen so that you can actually see um, the errors themselves in our test instance, that's not the case. So when you're in the app log under level to filter out everything else, we're gonna type the word debug in that filter um, field. 
And then under logger name, we can use the wildcard. And hopefully you can see this. We're going to use, um, you know, in the percent signs, we're going to type the word EMIS. This then is going to bring up, you know, just those debug errors for the re EMIS reports that we just ran through that debug. And you can see here, and I'm going to be able to show you a little clearer in a second here, it's going to give us more information um, about what those errors really truly are pertaining to. Okay. All right. Um, what can happen then is once you, you know, going back to our instance, so you can, we, I can actually show you this for real. Um, again, this is a test instance and I don't have those, um, any errors that I can show you. That's why I pulled it up on that Word document. But what you can do is easily create a report then of these errors. So under the report option, I would switch this um, format to be Excel data. So if you arrow down, select Excel data, and then generate the report. So this is gonna give us a true picture then of exactly what those errors are being generated about or for. So this is an example of the report. So you can see here, um, you know, all kinds of different errors that that might be encountered. Um, cannot calculate absence length, um, you know, no active compensation, but it gives us the specific position and employee that um, this those errors are pertaining to. Okay. Um, there's one, you know, another common error is there's um, no hours per day. All right, and we're going to talk about each of those, um, you know, when we get um, a little bit further in the presentation today. But that's step one. So districts are going to want to run these reports and, you know, keep running them until they're air free. All right. Does anybody have any questions as far as the whole debugging and because that that's kind of um, something different than what you've had to do in the past. Okay, if at any time you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt, ask, don't, don't hesitate. You can type them in chat. I'll try to keep an eye on that too. Okay, um, we do know that, um, you know, there, there is a need for, um, you know, a true per debt per se report. Um, so there is a JIRA issue that we have created that's gonna, um, you know, truly produce a per debt report so that, um, you know, you, you at the ITC don't have to go through um, everything that, you know, all those debugging options that we just talked about. Oh, one thing I did wanna point out that I forgot, once you've, um, completed your debugging, um, we do advise you to go back in and turn that off. It's not going to hurt anything. It's just, you know, causing a lot of extra work behind the scenes um, that's really not necessary. So if you go back then to system and then to monitor, and then again, go to the logging tab. And if you search for um, EMISR, we're gonna actually just double click on that cell, that field again, and we're gonna make um, that option be blank and then click save. Okay. So that's just something I forgot to point out that we do you know, ask you to turn that off. So this is what can happen before you even get to the data collector part. So you know, again, encourage your districts to run those EMIS reports and get all of that information cleaned up. So again, I mentioned, you know, we do understand that there is a need for a, a true, you know, replacement for per debt. Um, so I've included that um, feed, feedback issue here, um, 1361. So if you want to watch that, you know, kind of follow its progress, see where it's at. Um, we, you know, we do have intentions of, of making that available, um, you know, in the future. 
my goodness, my mouse is so jumpy. I'm sorry. Okay. So next, um, you know, we're ready to move on then to the, the data collector side of things. And there are all sorts of resources that are available when it comes to helping correct those errors. Um, the ODE EMIS manual is, you know, a great resource. So it's broken out for those of you that are not familiar with it by um, the different reporting elements. So, you know, as we just talked about earlier, the CI, the CK, the CJ, um, the CC, CL, and CP. So these are all chapter three deals with staff reporting. Okay. And I also have a link um, included in the presentation that will take you right to this, you know, area on ODE's website. So, you know, the collection's done, um, you know, again, we're pointing after those initial EMIS reports are done, we're pointing you, you know, districts to use their level ones as their, you know, per debt heirs. And that's where they're going to go then from here on out to make sure that, you know, the information that they're reporting is air free and accurate. So within these level one heirs, um, there's, you know, very helpful information. And if you're not used to um, looking at these, um, I wanted to point out, you know, kind of some tips and tricks. So within the description of the level one error is actually some very helpful information. So it starts out with CI, which that tells us then what record, what EMIS record is this error pertaining to? So we know that the CI, we just talked about it earlier, is pertaining to the staff demographic record, okay? Staff demographic equals the employee side of things on the payroll, in the payroll world. It also has a code after it. So in this case, it's 100. So within the EMIS manual, these codes are, these same codes are also listed. So we have CI 100 in the error. If we go to the manual and we go to that CI chapter and we search for CI 100, it's going to take us right to that point. Um, and in this case, it's the education level element and give us more information about what that error, um, what might be causing that error or what the system is looking for. Okay, so again, um, let me quickly show you here um, what I'm talking about. So here's the chapter. I'm going to go to the CI chapter, and I can quickly just use my control F and type in that error code. Whoops, it was 100, wasn't it? And it's going to find all occurrences then of that error that we're looking for. So it takes me right then to that education level element that we just, I just showed you. And it's gonna tell me then, you know, what what exactly is, is it look, is the, um, this particular error being caused by? <clears throat> okay. So that's how to read those, you know, error codes. Use these codes that are in the errors to your benefit. Look at the manual you know, search for those errors, um, you know, and that's kind of step one. We've also taken this one step further um, and we have a document that I will be um, posting um, on our trainings and um, meetings and trainings page after the session is over today. We've taking, taken all the level one errors. Um, so whether they be coming from the CI record the CK record, the CJ record, or the CC record. We've taken all those level one errors and we've actually, you know, in, this comes right from the level one report, um, the severity, the code, the error code, the error message, and then the description. So again, you know, use these codes in conjunction with the manual. We've taken this one step further and there's going to um, you'll notice there's a column um, that's been added that says state software location. So this 
is on the payroll side then where you're going to go or want to go to start researching and look at you know what could be causing the problem so in this case you know this error message here will use the race ethnic group um we've included the screen then so the employee screen the section on the screen which is race and then the actual field so you can see you know gender employee it's in the general section and it's the general field so we've done this for all of the reporting elements so if i scroll it's kind of a big document here if i scroll through you're going to see all of those state software locations added to all those different error messages okay so hopefully um this will be helpful as well um i do know that ode it's my understanding that ode plans to provide you know something very similar from their end as far as level one's errors go um so you might look forward to um, be getting something from ODE um, and the collection side as well. Okay. All right. Again, I'll post that um, this PowerPoint and the spreadsheet um, on our trainings or meetings and trainings um, page um, after this um, presentation is over. So look forward to that. All right. Moving right along. So I thought we'd take a deeper dive into, you know, those areas that we get most questions on um, when it comes to errors and kind of, you know, you, you can use, you know, what we just talked about in conjunction with kind of understanding how it works um, and maybe putting those all of those pieces together, um, you know, will help in, you know, understanding what the air what the air truly means and then where to go to fix it so um you know there is some as we mentioned earlier some difference in terminology so state software uses what's listed on the left hand side and then emis uses a different set of you know um, words so i think that in itself can be confusing so just making the correlation between hours in a day on state software side means length of workday on the EMIS side. Contract workdays means scheduled workdays. Pay unit means pay type, and contract amount means pay amount slash or rate. So once we get the terminology kind of um, you know understood, then that might be helpful in knowing oh you know when I'm talk when they're referring to scheduled workdays. That means, you know, contract work days, and that's pulling from the position or compensation record. And we're going to go through each of these four areas to try to get a better understanding so that hopefully when those errors come through in these areas, we can, you know, know where to go and have a better understanding of that. So when it comes to um, hours in a day, again, that means length of work day in the EMIS world. So where is this information pulled from? Well, first of all, it's pulled from the position in the EMIS related information section in the hours in a day field. So if there is information entered on the position record, then that's what's reported when the data collector you know, pulls that information. If it's not, then it goes then to the position, um, I'm sorry, the hours in a day on the compensation record. So remember those position fields are the quote override fields. And I can show you that just so we have a clear understanding of what I'm talking about. So if I go to core and I go to position, and I'm gonna open one of these positions up, these, this, um, the fields that are within the EMIS related information section are what we call the override fields. Now, one thing I do want to point out that um, it's kind of a side note, 
but it is a little helpful tip. Um, you know, by default, these fields are named the same. So it's going to, um, by default, the um, in the EMIS related information section, this field would be called contract work days. This field would be called hours in a day. Um, there is, where's the other one I'm looking for? Oh, contract amount, contract work days, hours in a day. So they're all right here. You, these are actually custom fields. So what we do encourage districts um, to do is actually go in and rename those to be something more meaningful. So they're not the same when you're pulling reports, when you're um, looking at things um, on grids, you can tell exactly that this is pulling, this field is pulling from position and it's the, you know, EMIS related contract amount field. It's the, you know, EMIS override field for the work days and hours in a day. So if you're not familiar with that, I can show you that quickly here. Oops. Under system, custom field name, um, you can, you know, search by position. I'm just going to scroll down quick. You can see that we've then edited these EMIS quote override fields and added something in addition to that display name to make them, you know, different than um, the compensation records um, field names. So just a little side note that might be helpful if you're not um, familiar with, um, you know, changing those so that you can differentiate between the two, that can be very helpful. Um, well, another thing I do want to mention, as, since we're talking about those override fields, is please, you know, use these fields with, quote, caution. Um, they aren't meant to just provide um, a quick fix to get around errors. Um, they are truly meant to report something else that, you know, is, is valid. Um, outside of what's being reported on the compensation record. So if you think of classic, if you're familiar with job screen, that EMIS contract info section, that's what these fields um, equate to, you know, in um, the redesign. So really, you know, use these fields only if something else needs to be reported, not an easy way to get around to fix um, any errors that the district might be encountering. Um, it can, you know, those errors are probably going to continue to happen. Maybe um, you might, you know, forget to clear these fields um, at the start of next year and, you know, inaccurate information is getting reported. So we do, you know, use these just like you would in classic and really only use those if, if need be. Okay. All right. My little soapbox about, about those EMIS um, position fields. Let's get back to what we were talking about. So again, hours in a day, um, we just, you know, pointed out where those are on the position record. And then, you know, the hours in a day um, on the compensation record is what's reported if something is not reported on the position record. And we're going to see this little trend here as we go forward. Um, so again, those EMIS fields are the override fields. When it comes to contract work days, Again, in, um, on the EMIS or the ODE EMIS side, the data collector side, it's called scheduled work days. Um, again, if there is something entered on the position record in that EMIS related information section in the contract work days, that's what will get reported as the scheduled work days. If something's not entered in that on the position record, then the compensation um, record gets used and it's the job calendar that actually pulls those scheduled work days. So it's going to use the compensation start and the compensation stop date to look up that date range, um, you know, that any days that fall within that EMIS fiscal year. And those are what um, will get reported. If there is anything, one little addition, if there is anything in the um, position the extended service field, um, then that actually, that value gets subtracted from the amounts that we just talked about. 
And then that's the final number of scheduled workdays that gets reported. Um, so on the position record, there is an extended um, service field. So it's right here. Um, that those days do get subtracted um, you know, from that original count. All right. Um, I did add a side note here when it comes to non-contract compensations. Um, they actually can be reported two different ways. So um, if the compensation is pointing to a job calendar that has work days on it, um, then that's one way that those work days can get counted and included. Um, keep in mind that we use a date range um, with a start. The start date comes from that system configuration, the EMIS reporting configuration, and then the fiscal year. So that fiscal year field on that EMIS configuration um, uh, field is super important. So that's what's going to be used as the start date, unless the compensation start date um, is after that fiscal year. So if you have, you know, somebody that starts mid-year, then that compensation start date is going to be later than, um, you know, say uh, July 1st. So that's the start date that's going to be used. Um, the stop date then, again, is pulling from the end of that fiscal year on that EMIS reporting configuration screen, or um, if the stop date is before June 30th. So that's how it's pulling that those work days then um, for non-contract compensations if they're pointing to a job calendar. Now I don't know how you know often that happens. It, it can, um, but if they're pointing then to you know some kind of default calendar, you know they're putting in um, attendance days um, and, and so forth. So in that case we do have to enter those contract work days on the position screen itself in that um, EMIS related information section. Okay. All right, I'm trying to check the chat just to make sure that we're not, I'm not missing something. If I am, please speak up. I'm not the best at looking at that. Um, when it comes to contract amount um, and those errors that can be caused, by you know an, a pay rate out of out of range. Um, again, if there's a value entered um, on the position screen in the contract amount field, that's what's going to get reported. Um, if it, there's not, then it uses the contract compensation record, um, the contract amount as the pay amount. Again, for non-contract compensations. Um, we don't track that contract amount anywhere, so it does have to be entered on um, the position record, um, again, in that EMIS-related information section in the contract amount field. Okay? All right. If there's no um, pay amount found, then the system goes through its own set of kind of you know, uh, series of determining how to get that pay amount. So if the compensation pay unit is hourly, then the unit amount or that hourly rate is what's reported, okay? So again, if there's a contract amount, that kind of takes care of the bulk of, of the employee's right. But if there's not a contract amount anywhere, then it's going to go look at the pay unit. If it's hourly, it's gonna report that unit amount, which is the hourly rate. If the compensation pay unit is daily and the hours in a day are greater than zero, then it actually does a calculation. And I've included that calculation below. If the compensation, again, is daily and the contract work days are greater than zero, then it also does a calculation, and I've included that calculation, um, you know, in the in the um, presentation as well. So again, it's kind of like you know, it goes down the line, and if it if any of those criteria are met, then that's what gets reported as the pay amount. 
Okay. All right. I miss, I feel like I missed a screen here. Okay, I guess I didn't. Um, so we kind of like, you know, this, this grid was actually um, used and put together. Um, and, and I thought it was very helpful. Um, you can kind of go through and see then, you know, if there is a contract amount greater than zero, that's what's going to be reported as the contract, you know, pay amount. And then the salary type is going to be annual. I feel like I skipped a screen. I'm sorry. I did. My mouse is being so finicky. I am so sorry. All right. We talked about work days. Yes. Okay. I knew that didn't seem right. My bad. I apologize. So the pay unit. So before we get to the pay amount, we're going to talk about the pay unit. And there are actually two different options. So, you know, there's information on the payroll side, you know, as far as contract amount goes, but when it gets to um, the pay type on the EMIS side, it's reporting an annual salary or an hourly rate. So how is that determined? Um, so it's actually calculated based on the contract amount, the hours in a day, the work days, and the pay unit. And it's in the following order. So if we, um, if the system again sees a contract amount in on the position record and or the compensation record, then it's going to report an annual salary. If you know, if there's no contract amount, then it's going to go to the next line and say, is the pay unit hourly? If so, it reports that salary type as hourly. Moving on, if the pay unit equals daily and the hours in a day are greater than zero, it reports an hourly salary type. And then lastly, if the pay unit equals daily and the work days are greater than zero, then it's going to report an annual salary. So this is how it, you know, the system determines then whether that pay unit, when it gets reported, um, to EMIS is an hourly or annual pay type or salary type. Okay, sorry about that. I knew that we skipped something. So then um, moving on, we talked about pay amounts then. So, you know, those kind of go hand in hand. Um, so the pay type and then the pay amount. And again, we've already talked about um, these calculations. So here we go. Um, getting back to putting those two together. Um, so again, if the contract amount is greater than zero, then it's going to report a contract amount and the salary type will be annual. If the pay unit is, you know, if there's not a contract amount, then it's going to go to the next line. Um, if the pay unit is zero, I'm sorry, if the pay unit is um, hourly, then it's going to report the unit amount and report a salary type of hourly. And then likewise, I don't need to go through um, everything we just talked about. So this grid might be helpful in determining, you know, the calculated contract amount or the, the pay amount um, or rate, and also the, the what type of salary, annual or hourly. I do have a link um, to um, our wiki page um, <clears throat> that outlines, a, you know, a little more detail as far as um, how this information is um, uh, reported. Okay, when it comes to absences and attendances, this can be another tricky um, area um, and cause all kinds of errors. Um, I think it's important to remember first that this um, information is reported at the employee level. So we've had all kinds of questions about you know, we have employees that have um, a couple different positions. Um, one might be their regular position that's getting reported to EMIS. Um, so all those boxes are checked, um, but they have another that their position and compensation um, is not checked for EMIS reporting. 
And again, they're getting errors when they run that EMI, that initial um, EMIS employee report that says, you know, there's no hours in a day. So as we talked about, it's going through that calculation for hourly people to determine those hours in a day. So how, it, there is no hours in a day to do that calculation, thus the error. It's important to remember that those errors, you know, if you're posting attendance for um, those extra positions, then attendance is being collected at the employee level. So it doesn't exclude positions and compensations where those boxes to not report to EMIS are unchecked. It doesn't care. Um, it's gonna include any attendance and absence information based on the employee. So you do have to have those hours in a day and we'll talk you know, through those, you know, converting those hours in a day for hourly people here in a second. Okay, so again, it doesn't exclude um, compensations or positions that are, you know, not marked to be reportable. It includes everything because it's reported at the employee level. So if that absence in attendance um, is, you know, that activity date falls within that fiscal year date range, um, then it's going to be included. If there are attendance information that is not wanting to, you know, not wanting um, that information to be um, included in the collection um, for whatever reason, um, then you can use a, a, a calendar stop date on that compensation record um, prior to that first attendance record um, for that compensation, and it will exclude that attendance information and not produce any errors. Okay, I just think it, you know we've it's it's. I understand the confusion, but I think we have to get past the point that it's not tied to a position or compensation. Attendance is all by employee. If they worked on a Saturday, you give them an attendance day and that's a job that's not being reported to um, EMIS, that employee worked, so they're gonna, they should get credit for that attendance day, right? So it's, it's collected at the employee level. So, you know, attendance and absence can be um, tricky. So I did want to just point out some areas that can cause confusion um, and cause errors and um, calculations and so forth. And one is the termination date. So just keep in mind that um, the termination date is being used when it's accounting those attendance days um, from the job calendar for the employees. So if the job status is set to terminate, terminated, excuse me, then the stop date um, is used to find those days on the calendar. Um, so, you know, it is using that stop date, um, the terminated date, I'm sorry, to, to determine that collection of days. If there's no position termination date on the position record, then the employee termination date is used. So again, kind of going down the line and what the system is checking to finally determine what dates to use. If there's no employee termination date, then the compensation calendar stop date is used. And then lastly, if there's no calendar stop date, then the compensation stop date is used. And if none of the above apply, then it just strictly uses that EMIS um, configuration fiscal year. So it would be ending June 30th. Okay, lots of ifs, 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 but hopefully, you know, seeing it spelled out um, might clear up some confusion. And when it comes to hourly employees, um, those, attendance and absence days actually have to be converted to days. Um, so to do that, the system goes through and it uses the hours in a day on the compensation record that that attendance or absence is assigned to. Um, if there is no compensation assigned, then the system is gonna look to find the, an active compensation. The compensation date range then 
you know, those dates on that compensation is what the system is going to um, use then um, to determine if that activity date for that absence falls within that range. If there's no hours in a day on that compensation, then it's going to look at the position hours in a day. That's then the value that it's going to use be that, that it's going to use to do its conversion. If there's no hours in a day found in either place, then you're going to get an error. Okay, no hours in a day found. So again, you know, all tying back to those errors that you, you're going to see on those EMIS reports and likely in the data collector. So I did include then the little conversion it does um, once it does determine, um, you know, the, the values that we just talked about. It's going to take the length of the day, or I'm sorry, the length of attendance divided by the hours in a day. All right. Have I totally confused everybody? Probably. <laughs> All right. Um, lastly, then, um, I just wanted to point out, you know, it does take into consideration those EMIS adjustments. So if attendance and absence needs to be you know, altered in any way um, or adjusted, you can use um, those um, adjustment types of EMIS attendance and absence. Um, and just keep in mind that that transaction date has to fall within the EMIS fiscal year that's being reported. Um, I also wanted to mention that we did recently um, release a very helpful report. Um, so when you're talking about EMIS reporting and maybe, you know, clearing up any of those errors in the days and um, hours um, and that sort of thing, um, there is a, a report under the reports menu called Reporting Entity Count Summary Report. Say that 10 times fast, right? Um, and you can actually check the Select EMIS Days um, checkbox and then include your start and your end date. And it's going to bring up then a report that you're familiar with seeing, um, if you're familiar with Classic, the um, Classic report called um, RPT SUM Report Sum. Um, so please encourage districts to use this. Um, it's going to you know, be very helpful in verifying their days. Um, and I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of that because it is a, a, a really new um, helpful report. Long-term illnesses. So these can cause errors as well. Um, and it's, I just wanted to point out that you, you know, remember that these are a subset of your absence days. So if you're, you know, placing those long-term illnesses, which is on the employee record in that state reporting section, um, those actually, you know, you have to have that many attendance absence days or more. So if, you know, you put 15 in the long-term illness field, there must be 15 absences to kind of offset that. Um, if there's not, you're going to get an error, um, you know, indicating that those long-term illnesses, you know, there's something wrong. And that's usually the number one place to check. Okay. All right. Um, I did want to point out just some things to, you know, when it comes to errors, some areas that you can kind of go to as your, you know, first check, um, kind of, you know, first area to look over things, um, things that we've kind of, you know, found as a common um, mistake, not really mistake, but um, areas that, you know, you can go to first to check and make sure that um, there's everything's enter, entered correctly. Um, the first is going to the system configuration, that EMIS configuration screen, is the fiscal year correct? So, you know, as we move, you know, past um, the end of the fiscal year and starting um, a new fiscal year, you know, that's when that fiscal year ne needs to be switched. So be before they do their initial collection for next year, that fiscal year has to be rolled over. Um, so 
the first thing, you know, at the beginning of the year is, you know, oh my gosh, it, you know, none of my information is correct. The, I'm getting all kinds of errors. Check that fiscal year. Is it the right fiscal year for the, um, the collection that you're running? Um, next is going to that um, EMI, again, going to the EMIS configuration record and checking if that ZID prefix is entered. So once that's, you know, populated, you know, unless something would change, which I don't think it would, um, that should already be there. But, you know, if for whatever reason that got removed, um, you know, that's another area that you can quickly check and make sure that there's valid information there. Is the credential ID a valid number of characters? This is a huge one. Um, if you have any kind of error that deals with a credential ID, the first thing I would do is type over that credential ID. Make sure that there's no what we call white spaces in front of that ID. Um, you know, make sure it's the right valid number of characters. Um, and you know, make sure you save that record then after you've made those changes. Are all the dates valid, um, especially the hire date and the birth date? Um, we have seen occasions where um, you know, dates are um, not entered correctly. Um, really encourage districts to use that calendar. If they're you know, using the calendar and selecting the date from the calendar, there's really not a lot of room for error. But if they're entering those dates in um, currently, you know, it does, the system does accept an invalid date. Um, so that obviously is going to cause errors. Um, so again, you know, check the hire date, check the birth date. Um, I did want to point out when it comes to dates, um, you know, to eliminate those causing errors in the future, we do have um, an issue in place to check, you know, all the validations for date properties. And that's issue um, USPSR 6519. So if you want to, you know, also follow that and watch its progress, um, you can, you know, uh, see the, see what's happening um, when it comes to correcting that. So there's, those are just some areas that, um, you know, we've found can be just quick places to check and, and look at and make sure that, you know, something kind of obvious doesn't stand out. Another resource in correcting errors, um, uh, for those of you that weren't able to um, attend the fall 22 OETSA conference, um, Teresa and Sandy Spar at NCOCC did a wonderful presentation on EMIS staff reporting. Um, so if you go out to um, OETSA's website and you view the details, um, their, their um, presentation is linked under that EMIS staff reporting session. So I encourage you, if you haven't, um, you know, didn't have a chance to sit in on that or attend OETSA, that's another very um, helpful resource that goes into a lot of detail, not just error correcting, but overall EMIS reporting. And then as you're all aware, you know, we have the documentation, um, pay particular attention to, um, you know, the uh, core options that pertain to EMIS, you know, that being um, employee position, compensation, EMIS entry. Um, we also have a, a section called USPS and EMIS connection um, that probably all, all of you are familiar with, but it does provide, you know, some quick references, um, field names and locations and a checklist. Um, and we're constantly updating these areas. Um, I did want to try before the start of um, the school year to get um, the checklist and some of these areas um, you know, updated and, and have a new look. So you can look forward to um, <clears throat> that um, in the near future. And then obviously last, you know, if you're just completely stuck and you're, you know, you've looked at all the, exhausted all your resources, um, you know, we're always here, send a ticket to SSDT if we can help on our side or ODE if, you know, if it's more of a data collector kind of thing, <clears throat> excuse me, and we're always happy to help. Um, before we wrap things up, 
um, I just wanted to point out that just, you know, the final L collection closes on um, August 4th. Um, so in a few short months, that's going to be um, here. I can't believe it. Um, so just, you know, that that reminder to your district that that that's the date um, from the from ODE's um, calendar that the final L collection closes. And then we do have um, an upcoming training on August 11th um, that will talk about the starting a new um, EMIS reporting year. So that initial L collection, um, go through the check, new improved checklist um, and you know talk about all things, that, everything that needs to happen to, to get the year started. Are there any questions? Okay, I do see, and I appreciate um, this being pointed out. I was not at the OECN United Conference, so I apologize that I missed that, but I will um, include that in, in the slides as, as well before I post the presentation. Um, but it, it was pointed out that um, Missy Velasky gave a, um, you know, a wonderful presentation um, at the OECN United Conference on EMIS reporting as well. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, I appreciate it. And we can all use as, as much help and resources as, as we can get, right? So thank you. All right, are there any other questions, comments before, before we end today's session? Check the chat one more time. All right. Well, I thank everybody for their um, time today and um, look for those, uh, this PowerPoint and the, the checklist, or I'm sorry, the spreadsheet to be posted here um, this afternoon. And I hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Take care.